ahead and turn over if we can. And you may turn me down there a little bit. I'm uh, sound like I'm on the mountaintop talking down. Um, turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Psalms 32, and I want to go ahead and get straight into my message. And let me read. Let me read. Uh, read about five or six verses here, <clears throat> starting with verse 1 in Psalms 32. Listen to, listen to what Paul writes. He said, Blessed is he, blessed is he who, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom uh, the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. And for day and night your hand was heavy upon me, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer, and I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have, not, uh, I, uh, I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You will preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with the song of deliverance. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you for tonight. And thank you for every person that's here. And Lord, how we need you more than anything else in this world. We need simply to feel your presence. You told us in your word in Romans 8 that your, your spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're yours. And we need that, Lord. I need that confirmation in my life as everybody else does. So, Lord, I pray simply tonight that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart uh, be acceptable in thy sight, for you're our strength, you're our redemption, Father, and you're our everything. And I ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We all know the sins of David, and yet the Bible says that David had a heart after God. I believe there's two reasons that the Bible says that David had a heart after God. One was, was because of the fact he wanted the things that God wanted. For instance, it took, uh, for years, uh, Saul let the Ark of the Covenant just set places. David wanted to move it to Jerusalem, even though at first when he went, got ready to move it there, he moved it in the wrong way, loaded it up on an ox, ox cart. The ox stumbled, and the man reached up to touch it, and when he did, it, God killed him on the spot. David left him at the house of an individual, and he got blessed to pieces because the Spirit of God was there. David finally read the Bible and read where that the only people that were to handle the Ark were the, the Levites, and they were to handle it with these rods that went through the side of the ark and carry it that way. And so as they did, David did that. And as he did, he, 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 as he went before it, he danced before the Lord. And the Bible teaches us that in that time, every five foot that the ark moved on those miles from, from where it was to Jerusalem, they slaughtered an ox. Can you imagine the blood and the things at that time would have happened if they slaughtered that ox one right after another there? But, but by the same token, David set up a tent to put the Ark of the Covenant in at that time. Now, it's interesting to me that in the book of Acts, it tells us that when God comes back, he's, the temple that he's going to build, he's going to build the temple of David. Well, all day, why, why not the tabernacle of Moses? Why not the, the, the uh, sanctuary of, of, uh, of, Samson, or of uh, Saul? Not Saul, but of, of his, his son, um, Solomon. Why not do that? Why not, build, why not build that? Because it was in that tent that they offered a sacrifice 24-7. There was never a time that a sacrifice was not being offered at that time. And so what did that mean? Because there was continually sin being paid for and being offered at that time, God could be close to his people. God could be close to his people. And that meant everything in the world to, to God the Father, and it meant everything to David. But the other reason that David had a heart after God is because even though we go through Scripture and we find times that David sinned, and this is what we're going to discover today, his great sin with Bathsheba. But every time he sinned, God knows that we sin. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that all our righteousness is filthy rags. God understands that. He knows that. He wants to know if you know it. 
And if you know it, he comes to a place that he's trying to get you to come. And so that the Bible says in Romans, or excuse me, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Because when we're open and we're honest, what like God wants us to be and not be fakes and not be phonies and really come to him the way we really are, he wants to have fellowship with you. And that's the only way he will have fellowship with us. So David, when he sinned, but the other reason is that the moment that Nathan put his finger in David's face and said, you're the man, David said, I have sinned. David was quick to admit he'd sinned. So in chapter, in, in, in chapter 32, what we have there, when David looked and he saw Bathsheba and he saw what was happening, that she was taking a bath and he, then he called for her, brought her in, we're going to see that. And when he does all that, then he, and he commits this sin, a year goes by from the time that David committed that sin. Now he tried to, he brought Uriah back to Hittite. And the, you know the great sin of David in this thing, a lot of people don't realize when Saul was chasing David and he was after him to try to kill him, David is, uh, is holed up in a cave called the Cave of Adullam. And the Bible says that there's people that came to him. Men came to David and men that had owed money or that they were destitute in a lot of ways. And they came to David. He gathered this ragtag group of men and he brought them in. And guess who one of those men were that came to David to try to stand with David? It was Ur the Hittite. The very man that he had put in the front of the battle to be killed. And so he thought, well, I, he has a plan. And this is what sin does when we try to justify sin. Sin tries to take it. And he said, if I can just send him back. He brought him back and said, you need to go down with your wife. He thought if, because she was already pregnant from David. And so he thought if I could just send him down there and maybe he would go to sleep with his wife. Then everything would be over with. But guess what? Ura was a more honorable man than David was in that time. He said, I can't do that. How can I do this? And he slept outside his house. He wouldn't go into his wife while his men were out in battle. And David sent a word back to him and said, when the battle gets really hot, you all are to pull back and leave your out there. And you killed him. So for one year, one year, David knows he sinned. And listen to what he says about this. Because 32 is that sin. 32 is that time, that year in between, in between when he, when he, is, he, when he is asking to be, he's asking that God would, uh, he, he knows he sinned, but he has not confessed it. He hasn't confessed it. Listen to what he says. He starts with verse 3, when I kept silent. See, Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. What does it mean to regard? It means I know I've sinned, but I haven't given it to God. That's what it means. And God sees and he knows. And so David regarded that sin in his life. He hadn't given it to him. And so he said, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my growing all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer but then he goes on to finally say in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. When he finally did that, now we move over to Psalms 51. When David is crying out and said, restore the joy of your salvation. But in 32, he's saying simply this. He's saying that he's going through a period of time when he knows he's sinned and he not anything about it. And if you'll notice how it affected him, it affected him physically. I really believe with all my heart and soul there's a lot of people today that are sick. A lot of people go through depression. A lot of people are going to the doctor to get a pill to take care of something. And the reality of it is they've got sin in their life and they won't give it to God. I heard of a man one time that uh, actually his wife, he was depressed all the time. And she went to him and told him, said, you need to go to the, you need to go to the doctor and have it checked out. He goes to the doctor, checked out, nothing worked. So the doctor sent him to a psychiatrist. He goes to the psychiatrist, the psychiatrist starts uh, uh, prescribing pills and things. He prescribes pills, that doesn't work. He goes back to psychiatrist, session after session, that doesn't work. He finally puts him in a mental institute. In the mental institute, finally, they decide they're going to do shock treatments. They use shock treatments. After they use shock treatments, then what happened? Finally, it didn't work. And finally, he got with the psychiatrist. He was talking with him, talking with him, and it finally came out that he was embezzling money from his business. You see, sin does that kind of stuff. And that's what Jesus says. Now, it's interesting to me that if you read this in verse 5, 
Listen to what David says. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgression. And so here we go. So I want to get into this a little bit, and I'm going to try to use a PowerPoint on this if I can. And on this, so David says, uh, 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 let's see, 32, 1, 11. Go back to that if you would, please. Go back to that last thing. It said, we're going to have to do this because our clicker's all screwed up, whatever. So this is not the confession of David at the time of his life. Or Psalms 51 is the confession after he'd sinned with Bathsheba. And in Psalms 32, David is description, uh, describing what he went through knowing he had sinned. And he had not confessed the sin. He also describes the starting with verse 5. What a relief it was when he finally confessed with these words. He said, I have sinned. And I think, I think this is a description of Psalms 66, 18. That basically says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. He won't hear me. Does that mean that person is lost again? I don't believe they're lost again. It just means God's saying, we're not going to have fellowship until you take care of this. When you, there's somebody that you haven't forgiven, somebody you, haven't, you, uh, you don't have fellowship with, somebody that you don't, that you, you, something you haven't taken care of. Maybe it's a bill that you owe to somebody and you haven't paid for it. Whatever it is, God's saying to you, you need to take care of this before you and I can be on the same level ground. Now, if you go on to Psalms 32, 5, it says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of of my sin. So as a result of that, what's he saying simply to us? There are three words that communicate the same idea. Evil, lawlessness, as defined by God. In John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, he says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Have you noticed that's what's happening in our country today with lawlessness? Amen. And yet Jesus says that the love of many will wax cold. Why? Because of lawlessness. Now we go on and it says this. However, upon closer examination, each word also carries a slightly different, different meaning in these three words of what it means. So what, is, so, so what is the difference between when I sin or when I commit iniquity or by the same token that I transgress? The word sin is used 786 times in the Bible. Sin means that I miss the mark. It can refer to something against God or against the person that we've done. Exodus 10, 16, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Sin can also be doing the opposite, which is right. Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Did you notice that? That the Holy Spirit is saying that you cannot do the things that you wish. This old flesh that I have, Paul called this flesh. He said, within me, within my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He said, to will is present, but how to perform I find not. He also got, went on to say that, that, that his, his flesh was so black and, and, and dirty in a lot of ways that he could not even. He said that within me, everything within me is, is, is sinful. And so doing something that will have negative results. That we do something, not that I get, you know, I, sometimes I, I, it just has to come down to the word of selfishness. I see people that do things with no regard for other people. They, they, they did, their whole world centers around them, and so as a result of that, when they go to do something, they do something without thinking how this is going to affect somebody else. How this is going to affect them in any way. I think children are that way. That they get affected by what their parents do and they don't realize what this, how they live their life. You know, well, I'm going to, how, when a parent says, I'm just going to drop, drop you off at church and let you go, you'll need to go and, you know, but, well, well, daddy, why don't you go? Or mama, why don't you go? There's a difference there. Doing something will have a negative result. Proverbs 24, 33, 34 says, A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands at rest, so shall your poverty come like a prowler, and you'll need like an armed man. Well, Peterson in the message, here's what he talked about. He said, this is the story of a walk by the field of old lazy bones. See, sin is not only doing something, committing something, but it's also when I don't do something. 
you know, I, I've thought about this not long ago, and I thought about the fact that, you know, we talk about uh, two, there's two sins against the Holy Spirit. What are those two sins? One is quenching the Holy Spirit. Quenching the Holy Spirit. The other is what? Grieving the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we do something that He has told us not to do. Or we grieve Him because we act in a way that's it's contrary to Him. But the Bible says we also, which is worse? Grieving or quenching? People would probably say, well, I think grieving would be worse. No, I don't know necessarily what it is. Sometimes when we quench the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is telling us to do something and we refuse to do it, we quench it. It's just as bad as if we grieve the Holy Spirit. Failing to do something you know is right. Failing to do something that you know is right is sin. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. What's he saying to us? He's saying, if, if I know there's something that I should be doing and I refuse to do it, it says it's sin. Now, a lot of people don't want to admit to that. A lot of people will call sin mistakes. They'll call it all kinds of stuff. And, and they'll, they'll say, well, you know, I really don't sin. I just commit mistakes. Well, that's not true. That's how God looks at it. In the Old Testament, God instituted sacrifices for unintentional sins. Like in Numbers 15, 27, and, and, and it says, And if a person sins unintentionally, then he shall bring a female goat in the first year of sin offering. God even went so far that if, if a man was out working with an, like an, uh, an axe head, and, and he went to chop wood, and the axe head fell off, flew off, and hit somebody else in the head, there was even a sacrifice for that. Now, and also, let me show you something else. Look at this, and this is interesting. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 21. You, you just stay where you're at, Luke, as far as on the screen. But I, I want to just show you something here. Listen to what it says over in, in um, uh, Deuteronomy 21. And this is interesting to me because this is almost like this is a, a sin uh, for unintentional things. But, and it talks about that if here's something that's happened and you don't know uh, and you don't know that uh, uh, you don't know it's ha that who, who actually had done this and uh, uh, well let's see I said uh, well okay let me go on from there and I'll come back to it all right let me do this uh, so so there's sins for unintentional things but there's also a sin in general term for anything that falls short of the glory of God what is the glory of God? The glory of God is his goodness. Romans 3, 23, when it says we've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, we've fallen short of his goodness. Sin leads to a downward progression that without restoring the power of the Holy Spirit, we all tend towards. We have a tendency towards this. That it leads to a progression within. You know, some people, if, if they won't, the, the book of Hebrews tells us if there's people that won't forgive people, that in, and as a result of that, a spirit of bitterness comes into their life. And when a spirit of bitterness comes into their life, the next thing you know, it goes on to say that as a result of that, that spirit of bitterness, and you read on to the next verse, and it talks about that, it talks about fornication. What's it saying? If you allow bitterness to come into your life as a result of not unforgiveness or whatever, that as, you, as a result of that, it will lead to other sins. The sin nature is present in every human being born since the fall of Adam in Genesis 3, 6. So when a woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit, and she also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate of it. If left unchecked, continued sin leads to a reprobate mind. Now, what is a reprobate mind? Well, in Romans 1, 24... The Bible says that God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves or to a debased mind. It, let's, let's go over just a minute over to Romans 1. And let me show you something. There is a progression in Romans 1. In Romans 1, look at what it says here. It says, starting with, uh, starting with actually with verse 24. It, it talks about three times here that God gave them up. Romans 1, verse 24. I believe this is, is what's going on today. Verse 24. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. 
and, and to exchange the truth of God of life and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who blessed forever. Amen. What is that? That's the 1960s. Free love. When we begin to worship the creation rather than the creator and everything was free. Every man did what was right in his own life and his own eyes. You go on to verse uh, 26. It says, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what was against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one man and another man, and committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And so what is that? That's the 1980s. What are we talking about now? Now we're talking about what? We're talking about homosexuality. It's God just talking what it is. And then finally we come to the time of our day. It says, you look at verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God, brother, we're living in times they don't want anything about God, and their knowledge of God gave them over to a debased mind or reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting. What does that mean? It means they cannot tell the difference between what's right and what's wrong. That's what it means. And so if we leave the... the the sinful nature that we got unchecked. That's why Paul talks about he, he, every day he, uh, he beats himself up or he, beats his, he, he takes his flesh and he beats his flesh up to the point that it cannot have the power in his life. And so therefore God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts and dishonor of their bodies among themselves on a debased mind. Our sin nature causes us to gravitate naturally toward selfishness. Envy, pride, even when we're trying to be good is what it does. How important it is that we understand that every day I've got to have time alone with him. The only way I can live the Christian life is that I have an absolute total commitment to Christ. Day by day, moment by moment. I know I'm saved by his grace. I could not save myself, so I know it's there. But I'm going to tell you, I'm learning and learning more and more that the only way I can make it and, and live this life is I've got to depend on him. If I don't depend on him moment by moment, day by day, I will backslide. And I'll tell you that right now. The Apostle Paul alluded to this preposition, predisposition to sin when he wrote in Romans 7, 18, For I know that's in me, that's in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. He goes on, and, and I, I threw this sort of in Romans, uh, in Romans chapter 7, verse 17. I want you to notice something here. It, because it goes on to say in Romans 7, verse 17, uh, it says, now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Our flesh is sinful, and it wants to sin. This is why I need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life to check all that. He goes on to verse 20, now if I, and if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Well, you say, well, then if it's sin that dwells within me, it gives me an excuse. It's not my responsibility. Oh, no, God expects you to keep things into check. Absolutely does. But this is exactly why when we go over to 1 John, and in 1 John, one of the things it tells us to do in 1 John about, it's talking about sin when it tells us at the very first of it, when it says, uh, 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 when it tells us simply that, that if, uh, verse 6, whoever abides in me, him does not sin. Well, you say, wait a minute now, Lee. Because, did, did he not tell us just over in chapter 2 of 1 John that my little children sin not, but if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father? What does it mean? That part of me that's of the flesh can sin. It wants to sin. But I've got to combat it with, my pre with the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life where I don't do that. But he says it does not sin. That part of me that's been born of God does not sin. And this is the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. And so he just goes on here and tells us simply that there's part of me that I've really got to fight through in all this stuff. And so I have a responsibility to live that way. Now, the sin nature leads to trespassing. Well, a trespasser, now we go to trespassing. We've talked about sin, now we're talking about trespassing. A trespasser is someone who crosses a line or climbs a fence that he should not climb. A trespass may be intentional uh, or unintentional. Trespass also means to fall away after being close beside. 
Peter trespassed when he denied Jesus. He was close to Jesus, but he said, I don't even know him. Well, all across the line, in thought, word, or in attitude, many times a day, and should be quick to forgive others who do the very same, because he forgives us. Matthew 6, 15 said, If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you, forgive you your trespasses. And so in that we have, no, we have no excuse. Transgression refers to the presumptuous sins. To transgress is, is to intentionally disobey. Transgression is to willfully trespass. Samson initially broke his Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow had three things. It, he, you couldn't touch a dead person, you couldn't drink strong drink, and you couldn't cut your hair. And so he tells us simply that in Jude 14, 8, 9, that after some time when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. And he took some of them in his hands and went along eating. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave some of them, and they also ate. But he did not tell his parents that he had taken the honey or the carcass of the lion. He had taken a vow that he wasn't going to do that, and yet he lied to his parents. Judges 16, 17, that he told her he's talking now to, uh, to uh, the woman who cut his hair, his hair and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite from God from my mother's womb. If I have shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Or in other words, Samson knew there was what was going to happen. He knew he put himself into that place. Do you believe that God warns you before you sin? I do. Do you believe he comes to you and tells you don't do that? I do. And so David was referring to this kind of sin when he wrote simply, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. That's what he was referring to. Now, I want to come back to that at the end. When we knowingly run a stop sign, tell a liar, or blatantly disregard an authority, we're transgressing. We're transgressing. And so, um, iniquity is more deeply rooted. And iniquity refers to a premeditated choice. To commit iniquity is to continue without repentance. David sinned with Bathsheba that led to him killing of her husband. Urah was iniquity. And so David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Ur the Hittite? And I want you to notice at the first, and this is not included in this, how did David get in trouble? The Bible says he was sleeping late all the time. Because it says that when men got up at that time to go out to war, where was David? He was still in the sack. He didn't go to war. He didn't do what God had told him to do. So as a result of that, when he did that, he sent and inquired about the woman. And they said, That's, they, right there, here's another warning sign. This is, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of the guy who came to you and helped you when, you were, when Saul was trying to kill you? That's who she is. He's his wife. Then David sent messengers and took her, and he came into him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. He thought everything was covered. He thought everything was fine. The Bible tells us simply that if we sin, be not deceived. Your sin shall find you out. That's what the Bible says. 2 Samuel 12, 9 says, you know, he says, this is Nathan talking to him. He says, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? This is one year later. And you have killed Ur the Hittite in the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the people of Amnon. Micah 2 1 says this Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light they practice it because it is the power in their hand. Now think about this, what he's saying. He's saying, Here's a person that they're laying on their bed and they're already thinking about, they're working out how they're going to do things. On their bed at that time. And as a result of that. In the morning light. Then they go and they begin to practice it. And they practice it because they think the power is in their hand. How the devil comes to us many times. And tries to get us to justify what we do. He comes to us and says simply. Well you deserve this. Well you ought to be able to do this. Because nobody, nobody else knows about it. Or whatever. You, ought, you, you know you deserve this. You've been, look at the things that's happened to you. That's how he comes to us many times. 
In David's psalm of repentance in Psalms 51, he cries out and God's saying, wash me away, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Restore the joy of my salvation. Listen, God forgives iniquity as he does any type of sin when we repent. That's the key, guys, repentance. That is absolutely the key. We have to repent. We have to continually. If you sin, you've got to come and give it to God. That's what he simply said. Jeremiah 33, 8, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity by which they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their iniquities by which they have sinned and by which they have transgressed against me. Notice that the Lord mentions all three types of sins that he will forgive them. If There's not a single solitary sin that God won't forgive. You say, now wait a minute, Lee, what about the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit? I understand, and I'll get to that in a minute. Hebrews 8, 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Did you hear what he said? Now, if you've come to Jesus and you've asked him to forgive you, do you believe he forgives? Do you believe what the Word says? Then i got to ask is, if you have done that, then why do you keep bringing up those sins? In fact, the Bible asks a question that says, what profit have you now in those things which you're, uh, you're ashamed of? Why do you keep bringing up this past? Why do you keep bringing up, well, I did this back and I did this? Why do you keep doing it? If God has absolutely forgiven you of all this, that he's been merciful to your unrighteousness and your sins and your lawless deeds, I will remember no more. However, iniquity, when it is left unchecked, when it's left to the place, because we know that David suffered after this, because four times, David announced his judgment on himself. He said, whoever did this will pay back four times. And he did. He paid back four times with his children because of that. But when iniquity in a person's life is left unchecked, it leads to a state of willful sin with no fear of God. No fear of God. Hebrews 10, 26 says, For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. This is total rejection of Christ and a dependence on something, someone other than Jesus Christ. I really believe what he's talking about willful sin is what you have now switched and you're now trusting something else besides Jesus Christ. But he tells us simply that there's not a single solitary sin that he won't forgive. A buildup of unrepentant sin is sometimes pictured as a cup of iniquity being filled to the brim. In Revelation 17, 4, it says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup of full abominations and with the filthiness of her fornication. It's a cup that just keeps getting full and full and full until it finally runs over. And the Lord said in Genesis 15, But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. The cup filled up. This often applies to nations, and I believe our nations is in that same kind of problem. Nations who have forsaken God completely. You know, the only thing I think that's helping us right now, we, you know, I, I used to hate it when I'd hear Barack Obama say, that we, he'd go around the world and he'd say we're not a Christian nation. I used to <clears throat> just bother me to no end. Because I know the principles and the things that when we first, this country was established, it was a Christian nation. But let's face it, guys. Can we say that today? Can we say we're a Christian nation when we're, Aborting 60 million babies when, we, when we're saying that when we're, we're, we're flaunting God in the face when he says that homosexuality is an abomination to him. Somebody was telling me now that now we're celebrating the, the lifestyle of this. Somebody was telling me that during this thing this, we just had this past week that there was all kinds of flags flying and a lot of businesses down there that said they were supporting the uh, homosexual agenda you know I don't know guys we're, we're in trouble but you think about it when the world when the flood happened when, when um, Sodom and Gomorrah happened when I, when I think about Esther 
God always had a remnant. And he protected that remnant of people. And that's what we've got to lean on. We've got to lean on the fact that God will take care of us and protect us in this world. Even though everything in the world seems like it's going to hell in a handbasket. So, but continued iniquity leads to unnatural affection, which leads to that progression downward to that reprobate mind over in Romans 1. You know, and it gives us almost an outline of digression, of, of vivid, in, in, in just vivid detail. It, 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 hurt, it bothers my heart when I, I talk about what is happening in this country. The Bible tells me also the sons of Eli are biblical examples of reprobate who God judged for their iniquities. Uh, for I have told, and God says this, for I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn in the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Rather than repent, Eli's sons continued in their abominations until repentance no longer was possible. What do you mean repentance is no longer possible? I believe the only, the only connection link between us and God is Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to... Listen, the Bible says, and this is, we got into a little bit this morning, but 14.6, John 14.6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's the exclusiveness of Jesus. And the world doesn't like that. Well, the first thing they want to say is, well, what about all these other places? Well, if they come to Jesus, they're fine. But I also believe that the Bible says that we're without excuse. And I also believe that there, there will not be anybody that will stand in front of God one of these days and be able to say that they didn't know. You know? Why will he not? Because my Father in heaven is loving and kind and wonderful. He doesn't do things like that. He doesn't. But I also believe this, that the only, only, only link between us and God the Father, which we're trying to get into in his presence, is through Jesus Christ. But let me just tell you this, the only way that you and I can get through to Jesus is through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And there, the Bible teaches us that there are those who have the Holy Spirit's come to and 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 ask them to come and they refuse and they refuse and they reject it and reject it. And it's not the point that the Holy Spirit doesn't want to, doesn't want to save them. It's not the point that God doesn't want to save them. It's not the point that, the, that Jesus doesn't want to save them. It's the point that they no longer can hear the Holy Spirit bringing them to him. And that, my friend, I believe is, the, is, the, is a sin against the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about those who have their conscience seared with a hot iron. I learned years ago that, you know, there's three types of burns. There's, there's redness, like a sunburn. Then there's, there's blistered. When you actually get near some, you have blisters. But there's another burn, and it's called charred tissue. And it's when the, the heat or the fire gets down into the flesh until it finally gets into the nerve endings when you can't feel That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the fact that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. The biblical writers use different words to refer to sin in many of its forms. However, regardless of how deprived a human heart may become, Jesus' death on the cross was sufficient to cover all sins. Did you hear what I said? Okay, how far a person thinks they may have gone, Jesus' death on the cross was sufficient to cover your sins. I don't care how far you've gone. The Bible says in John 1, 9, 29, the next day John, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Romans 5, 18 says, Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation because of what Adam did. Even so, through one man's righteousness acts, the free gifts came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Because of one man, because of what Jesus did at Calvary, you and I have been set free. That's what it means. Romans 5, 20 says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense may abound. But listen to this, But where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Colossians 2.13, and you being dead in your trespasses and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven, and notice this little word there, having forgiven you all 
All your trespasses. All of them. Not just part of them, but all of them. And so Psalms 32, 5 is quoted that the beginning of this ends with these words. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And only sin that God can't forgive is the final rejection of the Holy Spirit. Drawing you I to repentance. There is an ultimate fate of a reprobate mind. When no longer can they hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to us, come to me. Come to me. Matthew 12, 32. Anyone, this is the words of Jesus. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven him. Even in this age, age to come. Luke 12, 10. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. It will not. But the good news is that God's hand is not slack. That it cannot save. And Isaiah wrote these words from the Lord. He says in 118, come now, let us reason together. Says the Lord, though your sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And the red like crimson, they shall be as wool. They shall be wool. He'll wash away every sin that you've ever committed. So what's the key? The key is the realization that we've all sinned, but we have to repent of those sins and bring them to the Lord. And, and I think the key verse here is, is not just 1-9 that says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, but to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's one seven. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's the key, being real with God. And the only way he's going to have a relationship with you is that you're real with him. Quit being a fake and a phony. Just come to him. Say, Lord, I've screwed up. I sinned. Just come and say, this is me, Lord. Here I am, and I don't want to do this. Help me to overcome this. Now, I'll close with this. The first two verses of Psalms 32, David looked at his life, and he thought about all, how, all the things he'd done. And here's what he says in 32, verse 1 and 2. He said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. And David was saying simply, oh, what a wonderful thought it is that the, that the transgressions of my life, the sins of my life have been covered. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful thing it is to come to a place that, to know that every sin that you've ever committed has been under the blood of Jesus Christ and you have been forgiven. But he goes on in verse 2. He said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose those spirit there is no deceit. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. What does that mean? Well, think about this. Why, if, if, if you have not sinned, why would the Lord impute iniquity to you? If you've not sinned, the Lord's not going to impute iniquity to you. But the very fact is that we know that we have sin. What is David saying? He's saying, blessed is that time that's coming when Jesus comes, that all of our sin are put on the cross, and, and, and Jesus pays for all of them. Blessed is that time when no longer will God impute iniquity to us, that we've been saved from sin. We've been saved from transgression. We've been saved from all the other things, iniquity, all the things that are there. God has paid for them all. There's coming a great day. You know, I look at some of these people in Washington and some of the things, and it, it just chills me to think that they think they're getting away with things. They're not. They're not. There's a coming a great day. Of, the Bible says there's an appointed unto men once to, to die, and after that, the judgment. There's coming a day of a great white judgment, throne judgment. And it tells us today that we're building up wrath till that day. And the great white throne judgment is not a day to determine who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. The great white throne judgment is to determine how much hell you get. Now, you and I have already been judged, and we've been found not guilty. When would that take place? At the cross, Jesus bore all of our sins. All of our sins. All of our sins. All of them. And so as a result of that, as a result of that, we can walk free. How wonderful it is to know that today. To know that every single solitary sin in your life has been forgiven. 
So tonight we're going to have a verse of invitation. If you're here tonight and, and uh, you've never...